<clears throat> yeah, so we're still going to finish up last week's, which is chapter 7, and then we'll get into chapter 8 today and that stuff. Uh, I'm pretty sure I did get posted. So within the active site, uh, what we're going to be concerned about is our primary structure, secondary, uh, and larger structure, because that's ultimately how it's going to grab or wrap around our individual substrates. Then we'll look a little bit, very, very briefly, at organic mechanisms. Um, because that's the next aspect on what you'd be looking at. And then the only thing I want to mention about your specificity or chirality is pretty much right here, that a lot of your enzymes will wrap very, very specifically around very specific substrates. Okay? So you have to have a very particular pattern for it to go ahead and, and react with that substrate. So chirality plays a major role uh, in a lot of enzyme chemistry. Okay? It's not guaranteed. It doesn't have to be there. But in a lot of cases, uh, we are concerned about different chiral substrates, and we're also concerned about the exact structure of your substrate as well, what's around where you're trying to do that in chemistry. Okay? So we'll go back to using chymotrypsin, just because chymotrypsin is apparently the most common example to work with, so we'll stick with that. So chymotrypsin catalyzes the cleavage of a peptide or ester bond. Uh, when we're looking at uh, biological systems, we're more concerned about the peptide bond, but the ester bond works, and that's where a lot of chymotrypsin has been studied. <clears throat> um, so what we're primarily concerned about first is what parts of the amino acid are critical to the reaction, and that's looking at our primary structure. So within that primary structure, we want to know specifically what amino acids are allowing for that reaction to occur. So it's a slightly different situation than we saw previously with our structure before, because we could change our primary sequence and it might change the folding pattern. Okay, in this case, we aren't concerned about changing the folding pattern. What we really want to see is, is it active? Is that amino acid in the active site? Okay, is it critical to allowing that reaction to occur? So to go through and figure that out, we can do a variety of techniques. You can try and do x-ray crystallography to get an idea on where the active site is, and then you can now target those specific amino acids, okay, those ones that are found in that little pocket where the chemistry is occurring. And you can tweak them. Okay? And in the process of tweaking them, we change their potential reactivity, which means they can no longer function as that amino acid. And if the enzyme no longer uh, runs the reaction, then that amino acid was critical to that reaction. Okay? So there's two uh, labeling substituents that the textbook decided to mention. You've got, I don't know what their non-acronym name is, uh, DIPF and what I was calling toothpick. Okay, the DIPF is uh, selective for your serine, and toothpick works for your histidine. Okay, so what those two uh, substituents will do is go through and change the chemistry. So what do you think the DIPF is going to be reacting with in serine? What's the R group in serine? You've got that OH, okay? What chemistry do we have with that OH? <coughs> okay, it is a dipole, so I don't really have a lot of place to draw, do I? So we'll say towards the left. We've got that OH. Those of you from organic should really remember what possible chemistries do we have out there. Yes, it's hydrophilic. But is a hydrophilic interaction going to directly be directly involved with the breaking of a bond? Okay. Your hydrophilic is just looking at an intermolecular force. That's not looking at covalent structures. What we're concerned about is potentially hydrolysis. How is the serine residue acting to help break that bond? Okay. And there's a couple potential reactivities that we can get out of that. What are those two potential reactions? So that's the next step of it. Before we can actually determine what that reaction is, we need to know how that species would react. So how does an alcohol react? It could donate a hydrogen. It could donate a hydrogen, which would mean we're looking at it acting as an acid. Okay. Or it could act as a base. It could accept those electrons from a hydrogen. Or does it have to donate those electrons to a hydrogen? No, it could actually act as the nucleophile 
to help cleave that bond. Okay. So our serine residue could be directly involved with that reaction. And by putting on the dip, what we can do is, first off, eliminate the hydrogen. So we don't have that acid-base characteristics now. Is the acid-base characteristic of that amino acid all that strong anyway? Not really. We're looking at just a standard alcohol. Okay. pK of about water, so it's not all that big of an acid. Um, but dip could also sterically prevent the oxygen from actually reacting as a nucleophile. Okay. So whatever we're using as our label needs to somehow prevent one way or another the chemistry that's potential to that structure. Okay. What about histidine? And since I'm horrible at drawing histidine, I'm not going to draw that one out. Kind of, sort of. If we look at its neutral state, though, or its physiological pH. Oh, I'm going to do this awfully. Um, I don't remember the structure. There's a hydrogen on the bottom. There's a hydrogen on both, though. Oh, yeah. This one's. So it's basic because it starts as a positive charge there. Okay? But that hydrogen could come off. Okay? So our reactive site, pen, work pen, there it goes, is ultimately around this nitrogen. Why not around the other nitrogen? It has a lone pair. That lone pair donates into the ring. That's an aromatic structure. So that lone pair can't act as a nucleophile or base. So all our chemistry is centered around that blue <coughs> nitrogen. Okay. What can that blue nitrogen act as? Uh, for it to act as an electrophile, it has to accept electrons. Where would it accept electrons? Yeah. It's probably going to act as an acid. So we could look at it almost as an electrophile in that case. It can take the electrons away from the hydrogen, which means our histidine is likely acting as an acid in this case. Okay. <coughs> we have the potential for it to act as an electrophile, but then we make this carbon really negative and nucleophilic, right? Okay. Which isn't all that likely. You're really changing the structure of the histidine in that case. So with our histidine, we're probably saying it act uh, as an acid base kind of catalyst, whereas our uh, serine residue will probably act as our nucleophile, because right? we really don't have that acid base characteristics. Okay, kind of makes sense? So if we were going to put in some kind of label like toothpick, where is toothpick going to sit on this structure? <laughs> probably going to replace that hydrogen, and we can put our toothpick out there. Close enough. Okay. So it has to, again, prevent that reactivity. Okay. And while we're looking at here is ultimately just the potentials. Okay. That's one of the most likely places. We could potentially try and put it again on the other nitrogen. But again, we've got limited reactivity on that nitrogen, probably not the best option. Okay. We might be able to force it. And in that case, what are we probably taking advantage of? It's going to be a steric argument on preventing the other nitrogen from reacting. Okay. Kind of makes sense? So when we're looking at our primary structure, what we ultimately can go through and do is either label these things to prevent that chemistry from occurring with that amino acid, or what we can do is change the amino acid sequence itself. Okay? And we can target uh, when we're looking at the biosynthesis and actually make sure that the amino acid uh, is not there. Change it to something else and see if the chemistry still occurs. Okay? The issue with that is we still have to make sure that it folds properly. Because right? at this point, all we're targeting is the reactivity. <clears throat> when it comes to chymotrypsin, what we're concerned about is the serine residue, what is that, 195 and histidine 57. Okay? Interesting thing about those is they are not next to each other within the primary structure, but they're both involved in the active site. They are required to allow this chemistry to occur, which means somehow what happens to our primary structure? 
it's going to have to fold up where those two residues get very, very close to each other. Okay, because they have to both be in that active site position. So that's where we'd end up looking at our secondary structure, okay, or our secondary plus structure. What we're concerned now is how does that uh, primary structure fold up on itself, and where is that active site, and how can our substrate get involved in it? To really figure that out, we have to use X-ray crystallography. I guess technically we could use NMR as well. Uh, to get that structural information and see where those amino acids are located next to each other and how we can then apply it. Okay? And within that X-ray crystallograph or even our NMR spectrum, they can prove that that serine residue 195 and histidine 57 are right next to each other. I could not even imagine analyzing it anymore for Yeah, it's actually kind of impressive what they can pull off with that. Uh, and you can't do it very easily with the standard one that you guys are used to seeing, the one-dimensional. Okay? You don't see that. Uh, what you would end up taking advantage of is that your hydrogen or potentially even oxygen or carbons from your shearing 195, because they are now physically located close to that histidine, we'll see a signal for our histidine hydrogen and we'll see a signal for our serine hydrogen and they will be coupled to each other. They will physically change their orientation to get close enough that they act as neighbors even though they aren't within that three bond rule. So you, okay. so you can actually still pick up those signatures. Okay. So it's kind of a neat process. I wish I actually knew more about it. Okay. How do they know that it is the active site? Because it, it behaves differently. Uh, if we look at just the x-ray crystallograph, how do we know it's the active site? So that just gives us our structure. Here's our structure. Right. How do we know that's where it's supposed to go? Well, but that sequence of our amino acids. What we can do is when we go through and do our study, we have to make sure the substrate's in there as well. Okay. Um, with NMR, that could work okay. With uh, X-ray crystallography, there's the potential for that working as well. There's kind of a slight issue with that, though. What's that issue? Does our enzyme selectively hold or bind and hold on to the substrate permanently? No. No. So what we would have to do is create some kind of mimic of our substrate that would have, hopefully, a tighter binding affinity. Okay, so that it went into the structure and it was frozen within that structure, within that active site. Okay. So some of this, or a lot of this, involves computer modeling and trying to decide where can we potentially fit these pieces or these substrates. Okay. Um, after we do that, we can actually move into our mechanism. So this is definitely an abbreviated mechanism, but you can see that we've got the serine residue. What's that? Uh, no, I don't expect you to know this mechanism. Um, we'll talk about what I would expect you to know of it. And then you've got your histidine residue. <coughs> and so what we're then doing is taking those individual residues, so we can, there's our histidine, and there's our serine, okay, and then our substrate is floating through here. So what we're trying to do is predict how this reaction ends up working. Okay, so what did our alcohol from our serine do? Okay, I know I just covered it up with a bunch of arrows. So let me erase everything. It attacked the substrate. Our serine molecule acted as a nucleophile and attacked our substrate. Okay. In that process, we would generate a positively charged oxygen isn't particularly stable, so what could our histidine do? Our histidine acted as a base and pulled that hydrogen off. Okay. You'll notice that where it started was not in its fully protonated state. Okay. How could that be the case? PH. The pH within the enzyme was substantially lower, okay. such, or sorry, substantially higher, such that it wasn't in its protonated state. 
that histidine can now act as a base and remove that hydrogen. All right. We then end up with what type of intermediate here? Those of you from organic chemistry? We have the tetrahedral intermediate from organic chemistry. Uh, that tetrahedral intermediate is unstable because we have three very electronegative elements attached to a carbon. Eventually that carbon gets a little bit irritated and wants to steal some electrons back. So it can take the electrons back from that old carbonyl oxygen, reform the carbonyl, but then we have too many bonds, so we have to break a bond. Okay, because histidine transferred that hydrogen, our serine residue is now not as good of a leaving group. And what ends up happening is the nitrogen will act as the better leaving group in this case and pick up a hydrogen from our histidine. Okay. So what we're trying to do is slowly piece together how these things can work and process their way through. The result of that is that we now have part of our substrate attached to the enzyme covalently. Okay, the whole point of this is to break that bond and let it go. Okay, at this point, it's attached. So we did break and one piece can float off, but now we have this extra piece hanging on to our substrate. How can we get that piece of our substrate off? Now we have to bring in another nucleophile. Another good nucleophile would be water. This is why we're in water environments. Our water can now act as a nucleophile and run virtually the identical reaction. Okay. So the serine is really there to kind of facilitate and allow for this reaction to occur much, much faster because we can't really control the presence of water and forcing water's uh, nucleophilic attack. So the serine... Uh, will act as that nucleophile temporarily. We can then kind of wait a little bit longer for water to come around and actually finish off the reaction. Okay. So within this, what happened in that? Okay, how do we want to talk about this? Um, we had the oxygen acting as a nucleophile from our serine. We had our histidine acting as a base. So if we're going to try and classify what type of reaction or how this reaction was catalyzed by the enzyme, we now have to come up with a way to classify it. Okay, so is it a covalent catalysis or is it an acid-base catalysis? And we run into a nice fun gray area on what's happening here. So biochemists went through and looked at it and said, okay, within that covalent structure, yes, it did change its covalent structure, but it ends up spitting it out at the end. Okay. Ultimately, what our enzyme did was facilitated the transfer or the breaking down of that covalent structure through an acid-base mechanism. Okay. So this catalysis is referred to acid-base because we look at the transfer of the hydrogen ions. Okay. Not particularly my favorite way of looking at it, but they want to come up with some kind of classification. So if we're looking at a strictly covalent catalysis, we're not looking at the transfer of hydrogen ions. We're ultimately just putting on and off a covalent structure. Okay, how do we know we're looking at covalent structures and not acid base? Nope. Acid base involves hydrogen. Okay, so if we're looking at an acid base catalysis, we're looking at a hydrogen coming on and off the structure. Okay, and ultimately, our enzyme is pulling that hydrogen on or off. In a covalent system... Sorry, when you yep. say coming off the structure, do you mean the structure of the enzyme or the structure of the substrate? It's ultimately both in this case. Yeah. Uh, the sampling questions go through and give you three reactions and ask you to classify them according to their catalysis. Is it a covalent catalysis, which I think is an awful term, but what they're asking is it nucleophilic, uh, electrophilic ultimately, uh, or is it acid-base catalyzed? Okay, so are you transferring a hydrogen ion to allow for some other chemistry to occur? Okay. To be able to go through and do this, more importantly, or what I think is more important, is you should be able to classify each of these, uh, first off, amino acids uh, according to this general chemistry or these separations of chemistry. Uh, but also what's happening within each of those substrates and reactions. So when we look at a, an arrow pushing, what did that arrow pushing show? 
Did it show a nucleophile attack an electrophile, or did it show a base pull off a hydrogen from an acid? Okay. Questions about identifying those arrows. Okay. Because I know organic chemistry was old for some of you. If you have questions about that, please ask, because you will see questions along those lines. Okay. Um, one thing I do want to tweak on this reminder as I continue to teach organic chemistry, I keep refining this definition. Uh, really what we've got is everything can be classified according to our Lewis definition. Everything is a Lewis acid or base, period. Okay. After that, we can decide where those electrons are going. If those electrons are going to a hydrogen, we can look at it as a Bronsted-Lowry acid base as well as a Lewis acid base. If those electrons are going to something other hy than hydrogen, that's when we're looking at our electrophile nucleophiles. Okay. So the Lewis acid base definition applies to all chemistry, period. Okay. Everything that you've potentially seen anywhere as far as involving atom arrangement can be applied back to Lewis acid base chemistry, except for radicals. <coughs> The biology definition. Yeah. Really care much about well, uh, Bronsted Lowry really comes back to history, is really where that's coming from. So if we push even further back, we go into the Arrhenius definition, which is looking at formation of hydrogen ions in water or the formation of hydroxide ions in water. And that worked really well to discuss species that gave up hydrogen ion or hydroxide ion. But it didn't work very well to explain some other things, like ammonia. Because ammonia acts as a base, but it doesn't give you this hydroxide ion concentration as much. So that's where our Bronsted-Lowry definition kind of refined that. And then Lewis came along and further refined it by saying atoms don't actually change their locations. It's all about where we put those electrons. Either the electrons are being shared or they're not being shared. Okay? If they're being shared, it looks like the atom location has changed. The nucleophile electrophile is just a further refinement, almost a step back towards a Bronsted-Lowry kind of direction. Okay. Questions about that? Isn't acid like Lewis acid and Lewis base? Like it's against the acid base. What's acting on actually Lewis base? So what I would potentially act, ask is probably in the electrophile nucleophile or your uh, Bronsted-Lowry acid base. So when I say acid and base, I'm referring to the Bronsted-Lowry. Okay. And when I'm talking, at, lock, talking about covalent structure changes, I'm looking at electrophile and nucleophile. I very rarely use the definition of Lewis acids and bases because it's not really specific enough to what reaction we're looking at because everything is a Lewis acid and a base. Okay. Other questions on that? Uh, should we go back through and identify what's happening in each of these steps? Or you guys think you can identify your acid and base definitions? So yeah. for this question, what is this half and half? You want us to kind of what you <clears throat> So we have to be kind of careful about what's happening within our half and half kind of situations. According to our biochemical definitions, if we're transferring a hydrogen ion, Regardless of what else happens, it's acid-base catalysis. Okay. Um, if we don't transfer that hydrogen ion in our reaction, then what we're looking at is a covalent change. Okay. And then that gets classified as a covalent catalysis, which is ultimately nucleophiles and electrophiles. Yeah. I kind of disagree with that because you're going to have transfers of hydrogen ions pretty much, period. But in a sense, all right. In the end, we went back to having the proton where it was. Yeah. We just totally skipped the middle part and said it's covalent. Yeah, no, no, no. This one's acid base. Oh, it is acid base. This okay. one's acid base. No, no, no. This one's acid base. Okay. Yeah. Right? Did I, did I not say acid base? This, this, one, this one would be a Lewis setup. This is a, an acid base reaction. So Bronsted Lowry acid base. So if we were looking at what it was catalyzed as, it is an acid catalysis, acid-base catalysis. But it finishes as... Yeah, I know. Can we just do the math? Yeah. 
So, <clears throat> well, the class, I wouldn't ask that classification system because I think the classification system is, is crap. Okay. Sapling does have a question on it. I think it's important enough that you should see that question as far as that classification goes. What I would expect on the test is you to be able to tell me what happened in this reaction. Okay. So in this very first step, what chemistry did we have occurring? Okay. And where did that chemistry occur? So I heard nucleophilic attack. Yes, our serine residue attacks. Uh, our carbonyl. So what we have in that sequence of arrows is a nucleophilic electrophilic reaction. Is that the only thing that happened in this step? No. No. What else happened? Oh wow, that's ugly. Where do the electrons go from that bond? The bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen. The dotted a line is saying that there's a coordination between those. What they're trying to show in biochemistry speak is a bond is forming. Oh, I thought it was like hydrogen. I thought it was hydrogen yeah. bonding. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's what I was confused. This arrow, so let's go back and let me highlight that arrow. This arrow right here, labeled as blue, is starting where? As it's shown. So if it's coming from the free electrons on the oxygen, which is exactly how it's drawn, so I completely agree with that statement. What happens when the nitrogen shares electrons with the hydrogen? How many bonds does that hydrogen now have? Two. Two. Can hydrogen have two bonds? No. No. So we're missing an arrow. Yeah, it's supposed yeah. to be given electrons back to the These oxygen. electrons would need to then push back to our oxygen. There we go. What's the shortcut, which is probably what they were trying to do, but didn't understand arrow pushing quite well enough? Show it in purple. We can go from the bond to our carbon. Because the, it's the electron source is either coming from a lone pair or from that bond. So we could take it directly from that bond. And then we don't need that extra arrow. So is that what they did? Right? <clears throat> well, so that's ultimately the question, is can you decide where those electrons come from? Did they come from the bond or did they come from the oxygen? Ultimately, those electrons, you're talking about, it's not even angstroms, you're talking about extremely minute distance differences. Okay? And very arguably, the electrons in that bond are spending most of their time, whoops, that's an eraser, on that oxygen more than on the hydrogen in any case, which means they're effectively a lone pair anyway. So how do we come up with uh, mechanistic detail that proves that they came as a lone pair versus the bond? And we can't really do that unless you start looking at real kinetic arguments, which we can do in organic chemistry, but we have a real problem doing in biochemistry because... No. There's so many other acid and base residues floating around within our uh, enzyme that we can't control those. If we took the reaction out and set it removed from the rest of that environment, we could control those and decide exactly the order in which those things occurred. Because we don't have that control, we don't show it. Okay? If you go back to organic chemistry and look at that individual step to go from here to here, it's not shown as one step. It's shown as at least two. Okay? And that's because we have a better understanding of what's happening outside of the enzyme. Within the enzyme, we're ultimately predicting, we're saying it's happening really fast, and we're ultimately getting kind of lazy with it, saying that we know this happens, <coughs> the exact order doesn't matter that much to us. General. Yeah, so when we look at the biochemistry reactions, it's very much a general, this has to happen in roughly this approximation. So do you want to refer the exam to arrow push and show you, or how <coughs> Uh, it's not officially, <laughs> excuse me, uh, an organic chemistry class, so I won't ask you to arrow push. What I will do uh, is provide arrows and ask you to tell me what happened with that That's arrow nice. push. Yeah. In our in our red <laughs> arrow situation, so there's a couple ways we could ask it. 
I could ask, according to these red arrows, what type of reaction occurred. Oh, okay. So like that. And I can give you multiple choice. Nucleophile, electrophile, Bronsted, Lowry. Uh, I could even throw in Lewis acid and base. And I would ask probably, what's the best explanation? The best explanation really complicated. is our nucleophile <laughs> electrophile, because that's more specific. Our Lewis acid base could apply to Bronsted, Lowry chemistry as well. So it's not quite specific enough. Okay. Does that make sense? Is it in the all kind of you said like Lewis? What's that? All of them could be all, so all reactions can, can be classified as our Lewis, so it doesn't make sense right. to classify anything. If we have more information, right. it doesn't make sense to classify it okay. that way. Right? I don't think it makes sense to classify it like that. Uh, in organic chemistry, if you were asked to specify the overall chemistries and just provide all the definitions. So within an individual mechanism, like for instance at ASU, for sure there's a professor that would say specify... Uh, all your definitions. So in this case, the oxygen would act as uh, a nucleophile and <coughs> a Lewis acid because it is still technically a Lewis acid. Okay, in that question, it's a much more open-ended format. It's not multiple choice. Does that make sense? Yes. No. Lewis base. I wasn't asking. Oh, okay. And Paul, you had a question earlier too? Which one's a Lewis acid? The Lewis acid, the definition of a Lewis acid is an electron acceptor. Thank you, Adam. Our electron acceptor is our carbon of the carbonyl. That's what's accepting the electrons from our oxygen. Okay. Makes sense. Other questions? Oh, I always like your questions because we get to talk about organic more than we do the fine stuff. Mm -hmm. Let's just do organic. <laughs> uh, so the next part of this is we could look at our coenzymes. So now we kind of step away. And really textbook now is just getting back into just definitions, strict kind of definitions. So there are things known as coenzymes, which are required for the enzyme to function properly or allow it to do its job. And they usually provide some kind of intermediate chemistry, be it a source of energy or uh, a way to transfer electrons. Okay. Is the coenzymes <coughs> I get those confused too, and I think there's a slight differentiation of what that definition is. I would have to get back to that. The cofactor is on the active site itself, and the enzyme is part of the. Yeah, so I, I don't remember the exact definition on it, so I'd have to check. But if. So that's our at least first pass at it, is our cofactor is directly involved in the uh, active site, and our coenzyme has to do with the enzyme somewhere on the enzyme. So the textbook lists off two big coenzymes that are involved. You get NAD plus to the NADH. So we're looking at, uh, what was it, Nic oh, there we go, I can cheat. <laughs> uh, nicotinamide uh, attached to an adenine and a sugar. Okay. So what's happening in that case is actually the transfer of what? Careful. Is it the transfer of a proton? We're going from NAD plus to NADH. Did we transfer a proton? No. We transferred hydride. We transferred H minus. It's negatively charged. Okay. So that's kind of an interesting thing. Right? Why is that interesting? How stable is hydride? Not, not, not very stable at all, which is why we have something like NAD+, plus to help transfer that hydrogen. It's a proton with two electrons. Okay. So where is that hydrogen going to go in that structure? So I believe the structure we're looking at here... Oh, wait a second. I spent the time to find it. Where did it go? Where that hydride sits. Uh, I think that hydride actually comes in. Yeah, so there's our chemistry. It's not the greatest picture. If you look right here, what is that? Oh, the nitrogen. The little arrow. I know, it's so small. What is that little red arrow? That's a plus sign. That nitrogen is positively charged. 
does the nitrogen want to be positively charged? Absolutely not. So it wants to steal electrons. It can take them from the pi bond, which then means what charge does our carbon become? Negative. Becomes positively charged because it just lost electrons. Okay. So what does that mean? That positive could react with? Hydride. That negative hydride. The reactivity ends up not occurring at that carbon, likely due to a steric effect. It actually comes in up top. All right, so that would be our reactive hydride, and that's the hydrogen that was already there. It shifts the electrons all the way around. Okay. So we're pulling that hydrogen, uh, or sorry, hydride on and off the structure right there. How would, would you that? still keep your aromatics? How would you know that? Ultimately, taking a look at those transfers on seeing where it was. So first off, identifying that this is where your chemistry occurs, you should be able to pick that up because your nitrogen is positive. Right. Nowhere else do we have a positive nitrogen, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. So our chemistry has to be centered somewhere on that nicotinamide. Yeah. So then it's a question of where on that nicotinamide, and yeah, there are going to be multiple sites. Right. We've got that as a potential site. We also have this guy. And then if we continue to arrow push, we also have, is it this one? Yeah. It's also this position. Okay. As far as... Without well, seeing the stereochemistry, though, it's hard to see. That's, that's really where it's going to come down to. And so how would we determine how our steric effect worked? Right. Well, this is biochemistry. We do it and see. <laughs> okay. That's how it works. So can that be just like a really stable molecule? Because What's of all up? that resonance going on? So there is resonance within it, which is why it stays as the NAD+. Plus. Oh, so NAD+. Plus yeah. Okay. So NADH is the only reason we have NADH is to transfer hydride, that really reactive hydrogen or hydride atom. Okay. okay. So what can we use that for? What we end up doing is putting electron density into a structure, which means that structure gained electrons, which means it was reduced. reduced. NAD plus and NADH are really good at electron transfers. What we're looking at is oxidation reduction reactions okay, with those. When we move over to our B6 vitamins, what those are used for is the transfer of amino groups. Okay. This one is much harder to see, um, and I think what they're trying to show within this image is that we have a bunch of the intermediate stages. Uh, your vitamin B6 Initially, to transfer that amino is really concerned about that functional group right there. What functional group is that? It's an aldehyde. What's special about the aldehyde? Yeah, it's a carbonyl. It's not acidic. It's a big hint. You can attack the little We can attack that carbon with a good nucleophile. The point of our B6 vitamins was to do what? To transfer an amino. Transfer an amine. What's an amine look like? NH2. With a lone pair. How do our B6 vitamins work? The amine can attack our carbonyl carbon, and we can temporarily put that amine on that structure. The chemistry we're taking advantage of and the transfer of the amino group Remember the chemistry we're taking advantage of? Oh. Reductive amination. What? Yeah, hopefully you guys remember that. You're looking at imine formation, so it's the reaction of that carbonyl with a nitrogen. You can swap out the carbon or the oxygen directly for a doubly bonded nitrogen. That doubly bonded nitrogen is now an imine to the carbon. We can reduce that down to the amine. Okay. That amine is still now a nucleophile. It can potentially go out and react at the next position where we want it to transfer that amine group to. Okay. So the oxygen what, was lost? The oxygen would have been lost in that situation. It would be kicked off as water. as water. Exactly right. Okay. So your vitamin B6 can transfer amino groups, uh, ultimately through the reactivity of your aldehyde. Okay. What chemistry is this attack? We're looking at a nucleophilic, nucleophilic, electrophilic reaction there. Um, those typically get classified as covalent catalysis, which gives me the heebie-jeebies because in the process of doing that, what else are you transferring? Hydrogen. There's tons of hydrogen ions also transferred in that. 
but your B6 transfer of aminos are technically classified as covalent. Yeah. So Kinds the oxygen gets uh, hydrogen from what the environment? Yeah. The water? <laughs> That's what I was wondering. Too. I was like, where could it pick it up from water. Uh, it could also pick it up from an amino acid okay. nearby. Okay. Say like a histidine residue. Or maybe even, no, it wouldn't be those. Never mind. Histidine is going to be one of your better options. Okay. Depends on the pH. All right. Other questions? Okay. Oh, there it is. Bottom one, or that transfer of an amino is also known as a transamination. I don't know why I decided to add that as a. Where the plus ADH? Yes. On that structure. One of them is the NAD plus, like the bottom one. So this whole structure is NAD plus. The whole structure. The whole structure. Plus, yeah, so you've got the nicotinamide, you have adenine, so I think that's your N, your A, and ribose in, uh, in German actually begins with a D. So okay. you get NAD. Wow, they got really complicated. Oh. I just made that up. I I don't know where exactly their abbreviation for NAD came from. The whole structure, the whole structure is NAD, and in this case, it's NAD plus because of that plus charge on that nitrogen. And you say the hydrogen comes from an adjacent carbon? So the hydride would come from whatever you're reacting. From, from, another molecule. from some other molecule. Okay. Yeah. So it could be coming from a substrate, mm -hmm. right? in which case this structure is being reduced, in which case our substrate was being oxidized. So depending on what we're trying to do, maybe we're trying to generate this high energy NADH to transfer that energy somewhere else, or maybe what we're trying to do is get rid of that high energy and dump, dump that hydride off on something else. So the reason this works really well is that it's a balance between these two. And depending on what reaction we're trying to do, we can temporarily store that energy, much the same as ATP. We can temporarily store the energy within that phosphate bond on ADP to make ATP. Okay, I know that was a little bit of alphabet soup there. But hopefully everybody understood that. I love that. Okay. Is NAD the one that's involved in the whole Krebs cycle? Yeah. It is. In, it's involved in pretty much anything that generates or consumes energy. I think of it in Flashback memory. Yeah, and we'll probably talk about that a little bit towards the end of the semester. That's part of the like research project things yeah, that true. you guys are working on. Um, if nobody picks those textbook topics, I'll end up whipping together some whipping together, putting together some uh, quick attempt so that you've at least seen it and you can talk about kind of the general summaries of what happened in each of those. <clears throat> oh. Well, apparently I decided to animate both those things. Transamination, and then we also have a redox mediator. Okay. It's really bad. I'm not quite sure how that works, but okay. B6, As long as you get it right, I don't care. Um, so what we'll end up moving into now is chapter 8. I'm pretty sure I had these slides posted. Yeah, okay. Um, and I actually posted them reasonably early, too. I think I had them up on Sunday. Uh, not a particularly interesting chapter, in my opinion, because we're pretty much just coming up with a whole bunch of different names and structures associated with them, which is a lot of what Chapter 16, which is our next chapter, is going to be, too, just our carbohydrates. So what's ultimately the nomenclature? How do we refer to our different carbohydrates? All that structural mumbo-jumbo. Same thing's happening with our lipids. So when we're looking at our lipids, uh, they're classified based on their physical properties. Okay, that's how that lipid category has come about. Those physical properties are that they are water insoluble, uh, and you could go by and say they're organic soluble by their converse. Okay? However, they are amphi amphipathic, both. close enough, which means they're, both, uh, they're attracted to both water and organic. Okay? Uh, that does not mean that they're soluble necessarily in both, at least in their initial states. It just means that they have portions of that structure that is attracted to both. Okay, so we get very clear definitions between one side being uh, hydrophilic, one side being hydrophobic. Whereas with an amino acid, or sorry, a, a protein structure, 
our proteins have hydrophilic and hydrophobic parts, right? The inside is hydrophobic typically, and the exterior is hydrophilic. Those don't get classified as lipids because our amino acids change their organization to account for that hydrophobic, hydrophilic interaction. Our lipids have two, a very clear delineation. This side of the molecule is hydrophilic. This side is hydrophobic. Okay. So it's kind of a, a black and white line between those. Uh, we get two different forms. You can either have open chain uh, lipids or you can have cyclic lipids. And we've got a big list of all the different things that can classify under each of these. Okay. So we'll look at ultimately structures for each of these and try and determine that. Anybody have Z out of curiosity for first semester lab? What? Yeah. Lab. Lab. First semester lab. Oh, we had Tina. Yeah. So can you help me out for this then? Just because I like pointing this out. Can you draw the structure of cholesterol for me? Oh, I got that one wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I don't expect you to be able to draw the structure for any of these. I, I do expect you to be able to look at them and identify them and classify them. But I do not expect you to draw each of these out. I think he asked that on the first lab quiz. I yeah, was like, what? He did on the first lab quiz. Everybody's like, what the heck are you doing? But he's like, oh, yeah, they should know the structure. Okay. Fair enough. Um, <clears throat> so, with your cyclic structures, I'm not going to talk about them a whole lot because the textbook really just kind of says this is them and kind of moves on. Uh, and same deal happened with your, the textbook lecture slides. So, what we've got for our cyclic structures is cholesterol is your primary cyclic structure. It has the base functionality shown with that four uh, ring structure. I guess if you want to get really fancy, it's more than four rings. But, right? One, yeah. two, three, four, five, six. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Did you? Yeah. Just checking. Okay. <laughs> Nobody laughs. <laughs> Give me some sense. Though. You can boo next time if you know. Uh, boo. <laughs> next time. <laughs> So what we're looking at is our general structure for our cholesterol. Um, is that cholesterol? This structure circled is not cholesterol. The one next to it is. Yeah. So you need all those extra substituents to actually make it cholesterol. Okay. With cholesterol and those, and it's, uh, it's not precursors. What's, not, what's the opposite of a precursor? Post-cursor? Post okay, that's good enough. Okay. And it's post-cursors. All of those ultimately come from one precursor. I don't care. They're close enough for me. That one precursor. What's that structure? Nope. There you go. Iso. No. Isoprene. Nearly all biological molecules, particularly your steroids, uh, uh, steroid hormones and cholesterol, all have some derivative back to this molecule. This molecule in its most basic form it shows up as this. You will sometimes see it with the double bonds. Oh, that's like part of the circle. <clears throat> and those you should be able to go through and identify in the case of cholesterol. You won't be able to find it in its general skeleton. But you should be able to find all of those isoprene units within cholesterol. Okay. So when you look at cholesterol, you should be able to piece it out to find those isoprenes. So the ene means double bond, yes. So the isoprene is just referring to that general structure, okay, that general skeleton. We're not going to refer to it as isopentane, because isopentane means there's no double bonds. Yeah. Okay. So the isoprene is just saying that we have this general sigma structure with some number of double bonds uh, within it. Okay. That structure is found in a lot of different places in nature. You guys remember the uh, limonene lab? Guess what made up limonene? Two isoprene units. Okay. So isoprenes show up in pretty much every biological molecule, and that's kind of the building block on how we build these things larger. So that cholesterol only has one isoprene? This cholesterol is going to have a lot more than one isoprene. Uh, I think it has seven. So it's ultimately going to be drawing out the structure a little bit better so that you can see it. Yeah, that's Oh, like over there. Okay. Yeah, so I would start at that far end. Right. So I got three, four, five. 
And then this is where it gets fun. Which way do we go, left or right? Probably go right to identify that isoprene. And then in this case, I would probably go that direction. <clears throat> and then... Oh, shoot, looks like I circled the wrong direction. Yeah, we probably have to go back and change the order on that <laughs> sequence. Okay. So identifying the isoprenes can be a bit challenging. You will be asked to do this. The last question on your sapling is to go through and identify those. Okay. Uh, sorry? Yes, exactly as she said it. I-S-O-P-R-E-N-E. Um, so your typical hormones, so they talk about, I think, androgen and estrogen. So androgen is what the male form and estrogen is the female form. And they control all sorts of fun male-female stuff. Whoopee. Uh, they are cholesterol-based. Okay, They're based off of this kind of skeleton. Um, that's about all I can really say on that. That's ultimately what they are. So you can read about it. Okay. Uh, the open chains. Uh, I think are a little bit more interesting just because we have a lot more of them and so we can look at their structures. We'll start with kind of the basic, the stereotypical or the standard uh, for our open chains, which are our fatty acids. <coughs> okay, your fatty acids, where's my, oh, apparently I deleted my general structure. <clears throat> our fatty acid structure, we we're going to have a carboxylic acid functional group with some R group coming off of it. For it to be a fatty acid, that R group uh, typically falls in that 12 to 20 carbon range. Okay, why in that range? Why not any lower? Then it changes its solubility characteristics. The carboxylic acid takes over, and any shorter than 12 carbons, it starts to become very water soluble. Any longer than 20 carbons, we lose any of that water attractive or water hydrophilic attraction from our carboxylic acid. So our fatty acids tend to fall in that range. Okay. Uh, this molecule does end up being water insoluble initially because we don't have or we have enough carbon structure or enough of a carbon chain that it prevents uh, the hydrophilicity of our carboxylic acid. Okay. So its water solubility is very, very limited in the case of our fatty acids. Um, <coughs> as general formats, animals typically get classified as fats, and oil or plants tend to get classified as oils. Ultimately, they're the exact same thing. We're looking at a carboxylic acid with a big, long carbon chain coming off of it. Okay? The reason that we call them slightly different has to do with their phase. Fats are typically solids, and our oils are liquids. What about the amino or our fatty acid is changing to allow it to go change those phases? Kind of with the bonds. I want a little bit more than that. Substitution. Substitution, which pushes even formally over to saturated versus unsaturated. A saturated uh, structure, see where do they have it? They have it down here. What we're looking at is just a nice perfectly straight chain. All right, so if we're going to look at our melting points or boiling points, we're now stacking a whole bunch of those next to each other. Well, if it's a nice, perfect, straight chain, we can stack those very neatly and organized, which means what with the forces? We end up getting pretty strong forces, and we get solids. So in our animals, our uh, fatty acid chains tend to be saturated. All right, what happens when we move up to oils? Well, in the, or sorry, plants. Right? Swap the order. We end up putting in double bonds. Those double bonds cause kinks in that structure. So if we now try to stack that on a whole bunch of other ones, that kink kind of prevents it from stacking neatly, and we end up with weaker intermolecular forces overall, which does what to our boiling point, or melting point? Decreases it, and we end up with liquids at room temperature. Okay? So that difference between our, our animals and our plants is ultimately just due to the saturation of those double bonds. What happens when we look at butter versus margarine? <coughs> What's happening in that case? Butter is animal. Is plant. But what phase is margarine? It's a solid. 
if it's a solid, how did that happen? Our plants give us liquids, oils. What happens is we go through and we react our oil with a catalyst and hydrogen to convert those double bonds into single bonds and saturate it with hydrogen. Okay, so when we're looking at margarines, those are typically partially hydrogenated. Okay, partially hydrogenated because at least the old school of thought was that saturated fats were really, really, really bad for you, so you can't have saturated fats. So we'll take plant fats or plant oils, uh, and then we will change their physical phase so that it becomes more appeasing to the general populace. So instead of pouring oil all over your food, you can now smear it on with, as a solid. <laughs> so it mimics the butter kind of sensitivity that older people grew up with. Right. What we then later found out, it's terrible. <laughs> still not good for you. Okay. And one of the big reasons why has to do with our double bonds. When we're looking at uh, natural sources of our fatty acids, what double bond orientation do we have? Cis. Most double bonds in natural systems come out as cis, which is kind of odd. Why is that odd? It's a higher energy state. We would expect the lower energy state. When we go through and now start to catalyze and change uh, the reactivity, so when we go through and partially hydrogenate, what happens to most of those double bonds? They now switch to trans, because we've taken them out of their natural environment and have actually increased the, the energy to react them. Okay, so they start swapping or isomerizing back to that trans position. Okay, kind of a neat process that's, what's ha that's so happening with those. <clears throat> so a lot of it's going to come down to how those double bonds are made in the natural system and what they're going to try and do is probably when it comes into the enzyme you have to remove those hydrogens to make the double bond okay well if you remove those hydrogens and allow for a flip there has to be space for that flip so it could very well be a steric argument for why we don't get trans double bonds in, in natural systems then yeah. it's energy storage as well it's a higher energy yeah. state so we can pull more energy out of it all right. <clears throat> Storing fatty acids. So ultimately our fatty acids aren't the best place to store things. So what we end up doing is now stringing together a bunch of fatty acids in some form or another. Okay. One of the first forms that we'll talk about here are waxes. Uh, what we're doing is taking the fatty acid and we are reacting it with what? That was a bit odd. I shouldn't have circled it that way. <laughs> Okay, so what we've got is what was originally our fatty acid, and what did we react it with? An alcohol. So when we're looking at waxes as a storage system, what we've done is taken a long-chain fatty acid, and we've reacted it with a long-chain alcohol. Okay. So in all cases, what we're doing with our fatty acids to try and come up with some way to store them is to remove that acid portion or neutralize its reactivity. To do that, we have to convert that OH into something else. So in this case, we're going to convert our fatty acid into a fatty alcohol. ester. ester. Okay. We reacted it with a fatty alcohol to make a fatty ester. Yeah, I know. doesn't mean everybody read ahead. So what we're looking at with our waxes is looking at an ester functionality as opposed to the carboxylic acid. Okay? Each of those lipid categories is ultimately a slightly different functional group. Okay? I'm not going to expect you to know all of those functional <coughs> groups necessarily because some of them get pretty complex. Okay? Um, our waxes are typically found as protecting coatings for plants and apparently animals. I didn't know the animal part, but plants definitely have uh, a nice wax coating in some cases to protect them. Okay. Which we, oh yeah, earwax, yeah. yeah. I guess that was pretty obvious. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> with our plants, what else can we do with those waxes? Mesa, Yehoba. Oh, Yehoba wow. was a wax. We can convert our waxes into biodiesel. Okay, as long as we can get a, a substantial portion of it. Okay? Yeah, definitely a lot of work. So you can go through and do something similar with corn. What you're doing is isolating the, the fatty acid 
from whatever source, be it animal fat or plant oils, and you convert it across into a simple ester, okay? usually a short chain ester, because the longer chain ones have a very high uh, molecular weight, which means they tend to be solids. Solids don't work very well as a fuel. Okay? So we, we shorten the ester portion in biodiesel so that we end up with, instead of having that nice big long chain out that direction, just have a CH3. Okay. That still gives us the carbon-carbon bonds that give us the energy storage that we need for combustion, but it now puts it into the liquid form as opposed to the solid form. Those cars that you know, some guys make with uh, powered by oil? Mm -hmm. This is what they're doing. Uh, in Arizona, you can pretty much pour like straight vegetable oil into it. Oh yeah, cool. Because it's in, it's so hot that it actually like turns. Oh, self catalyzes. Yeah. Huh. Not even self catalyzes. It's just so like the viscosity is so thin that it won't actually go through the entire engine without having any problems. Oh, I see what you're saying. Interesting. If, in the winter, it, it's thicker, so you can't pump it into. I think it only works with carbureted motors. I think the fuel injected motor jacks it up. Not in the summer. Really? Okay, we won't worry about that now. <laughs> Sorry, off topic. Other way to store fatty acids <laughs> is we can move into triglycerols or triacylglycerols. So now instead of using just a single alcohol, we use a molecule like <coughs> glycerol. What's special about glycerol? We have three OH groups which means our glycerol molecule can actually effectively nullify three fatty acid chains. All right? And what we can end up generating is this new structure, which we refer to as our tri triacyl, gl triacyl glycerol. Triacyl, this group is known as acyl. So we've got our triacyl glycerol molecule. In the process of doing that, you eliminate water from the structure, and I did not balance that, so please don't point that out. Okay. We can look at what we can do with these triacyl glycerols. Okay? If we catalyze the destruction of them, we can do that with lipases, so it's a hydrolysis reaction. So enzymes can cleave those so that we can now have access to that fatty acid and pull energy out of it okay? by cleaving some of those carbon-carbon bonds. If we do this as humans, cleaving our triacyl glycerases, what we can do is now convert our fatty acid into this structure. What happens to the solubility of this compound now? Drastically increases, and this compound now becomes water soluble. What do we use this compound for? Soap. Soap. Right, so we take advantage of that hydrophobic tail to dissolve uh, dirt, or to ultimately convert dirt solubility from being water insoluble to now water soluble. Okay? That reaction, if we do it as a human, don't quote me on humanase, I just made that up. So uh, just in case you were wondering, is saponification, typically referred to as saponification. So what we end up doing is adding a bunch of base to that uh, fatty acid, or the, sorry, the triacyl glycerol, glycerol to help cleave the uh, our ester bond in each of those cases. So our base can come in, acts as both a base and a nucleophile typically, come in and attack that. Okay. What's going on with our triglycerols? Um, actually, before I completely step away from that. So what we're looking at is our general structure. And in that case, is we now have uh, big hydrophobic tails uh, with the potential of having double bonds in it, I remember those aren't necessary or those aren't going to directly affect uh, the reaction of making the triacylglycerol because that chemistry is all occurring up at the carboxylic acid end. <coughs> we also have a relatively high density of uh, polar functional groups up at the top of that, so we do still have a pretty polar head group on our triacylglycerols. Not the best, but it's it is there. Uh, we can now go through and change these over to phospho, phosphoacylglycerols. Uh, 
right? What's happening in this case? Well, we still have that glycerol, but instead of it just being OHs, we're going to turn one of those H's into a phosphate group, okay? which could be catalyzed using a good source of phosphates. ATP phosphoric acid. Probably doing ATP. Could do phosphoric acid as well, because that is used as a, a buffer system. Um, <clears throat> so what we end up doing in this case is ultimately the same overall structure. Now that we have the phospho phosphoglycerol, we can now go through and react those alcohols with our fatty acids and then connect our chain outwards. Okay. So it's now just ultimately recognizing that instead of being a triglycerol, we now have a phosphoglycerol. How is this going to change the overall properties of this molecule? Okay, since you said drastically, we'll go with you. How is it drastically changing? I'll teach you. <laughs> You're right. You're right. So you should have confidence because you're right. Because it increases the speed What's the issue with our phosphate group? It's negative. It's got charged. Negatively charged. It's wicked polar. That polarity is now going to increase the polarity of that hydrophilic head. So we're going to become much more interactive with water as far as our head group goes. Okay. So this could work out really well because now we've maximized that difference. Okay, we have a very uh, hydrophobic tail and now a much more hydrophilic head okay, from the triacylglycerols. So that's kind of a neat little adjustment with that. Okay, again, we can find these in both animals and plants. Yeah, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> we aren't there yet. We still got all these fatty acids to go through. <coughs> We can end up with sphingolipids, which I probably have misspelled somewhere in there because I had a really hard time trying to spell that. Um, so, yeah, I don't know why. I, just, I don't know, the SPH just didn't mix well with me. Uh, in any case, what's happening is we're taking uh, <clears throat> ultimately our glycerol and we again change its structure. So our sphingosine is the effective equivalent of our glycerol. Right, so what's shown up here in the upper left is our sphingosine molecule, assuming we don't have the fatty acid connected to it. Right, so if we cleave off that fatty acid, we now have our sphingosine. Okay. Now what can happen is we can add our fatty acid to this. And in the process of adding the fatty acid, we end up changing it either to a sphingolipid or sometimes referred to as a ceramide. Okay, so you get these other terms popping into it. And the, the ceramide is effectively equivalent to your triacylglycerol. All right. <clears throat> You'll notice that when we go through and do this, at least the way I've got it shown here, and I'm pretty sure if I remember this correctly, we only really put on one fatty acid group, but we still have this big, long, sorry, big, long carbon chain as part of the sphingosine group. Okay, so that's still present as a hydrophobic portion. Okay. Uh, we can go through and look at all sorts of slight variations off of this. So they end up referring to the sphingomyelin down below. Okay. We end up, again, slightly tweaking the structure. Instead of having just an alcohol, we can put on a phosphate, and it's another junk as well. Okay. And of course, as soon as we change the structure, we have to come up with a new name. But of course, we've got a great nomenclature system, right? So we know exactly that this has to obviously be called a sphingomyelin now. Of course. Yeah. So kind of be aware of that when it comes to sapling. You're going to need to have probably these structures out in front of you with their names to be able to go through and match accordingly. Okay. Uh, these tend to be found <clears throat> primarily in, again, animals and plants and typically in nervous systems, okay, which is where your myelin comes from. Okay, myelin is typically found uh, within yeah. your nervous system. Okay. The myelin. <coughs> okay. Oh, the next kind of fun thing to point out, what's the linkage between our fatty acid and our sphingosine? We now have an amide bond as opposed to an ester linkage that we had before. Okay, because we're, we're hooking up with that amine. Okay. 
With our glycolipids, uh, we're sticking with our sphingosine structure, except now instead of just a standard alcohol coming off of that, we put on a carbohydrate. Okay? Our carbohydrates are any kind of sugars. The most common sugars that get used are going to be glucose and galactose. This is where we come up with glycolipids. Okay? Glyco for our um, sugar. Okay? So if we again go through and take a look at our structure, Hopefully you see that we're looking at effectively the sphingosine structure, okay, except what we've now added is this extra little carbohydrate out at the end there. That carbohydrate is drawn in what kind of formation? Sure. Nope. Sorry. Particular projection? Fissure. It's a Fisher projection, okay, which we will talk about when we get into the carbohydrates more. Okay, so that's our chapter 16. Uh, if we go through and put on a whole bunch of carbohydrates off of this, instead of stringing on just one, we can now switch it up to gangliosides, uh, which now look like some big crazy-looking animal weird structure. Um, <clears throat> and those uh, are mentioned in your textbook. Uh, in the lower right-hand corner, we've got the structure of glucose and galactose. Which one's which? Unfortunately, you will be responsible for this. Glucose is on the left and galactose is on the right. And it's all about the OH. Okay. Which OH? This guy here. What if I'd actually changed this structure? I can't erase it now. Instead of being that, I put the OH down. Is it still glucose? Yes. It's now a slightly different form of glucose instead of being, and I don't remember this, I'll have to review it. It's our alpha versus beta glucose is about that position. <clears throat> What's interesting about that position, organic chemistry-wise, what functional group is that? <coughs> nope, it's not a carboxylic acid. H, it is a hemiacetal. So when we're looking at our sugars, sugars play a huge role as far as our acetal chemistry. So you're going to be seeing that chemistry showing up a lot. Acetal, not acetal, acetal. Uh, this one's technically a hemi, so I should have started with the H. because right, it's part way on to becoming an acetal. Okay. Again, we'll talk about that more when we look at our carbohydrate chapter. Do, do, do. Uh, sure, why not? <clears throat> Biological membranes. So now that we've got an idea on what all these lipids are, we can now take advantage of what these lipids can do for us, and that's ultimately our biological membranes. When we're looking at our membranes, what we're trying to do is separate the interior of our cell from the rest of the world. Everything is water soluble, so the only way we can really generate that separation is to put up some kind of barrier. And that barrier needs to prevent the complete overflow or the complete mixing between these. So it's going to have to have some kind of hydrophobic component. If it's strictly hydrophobic, we have no way of communicating between the inside and outside of the cell. Okay? So that's where we end up generating uh, <clears throat> using these lipids because we can put the head groups, the polar head groups, to interact with water on both sides of the membrane. And then through the middle, we can have our uh, hydrophobic portion. Okay, so what we've got here is a couple different sheets. Our versions of this, you can see a liposome. So what's happening is our liposome is almost like a miniature cell transporting a very small system within it. And then we can look at a micelle. In the case of a micelle, where are micelles used? Soaps. Soaps typically use micelles because what we're trying to do is transport dirt on the inside of that, which I'm sure you can read on that. And then a bilayer sheet, okay, which is ultimately what our cells have. So it's a very large version of a liposome. Instead of having something so small that we actually see a sphere immediately, what's happened is we've made it so long that within a small section it actually looks flat relatively. So what we're concerned about is what things now go into this bilayer. 
Okay, depending on what lipids we use, we're going to get slightly different uh, bilayer functions okay, with, within our cells. Uh, within, what do we end up using these for? So within animals, uh, cholesterol will show up within your lipid bilayers. And interestingly enough, within animals, we get less uh, fluid bilayers, meaning they don't shift around as much. It seems very counterintuitive. Okay? And our plants, they tend to be more fluid and shift around a little bit more okay, with our bilayer. Yeah, I thought it was odd too. <clears throat> um, prokaryotic membranes end up being the most fluid of all of them. All right, so we'll pick up there uh, on Thursday and probably push into chapter 16. Your exam is